Hello, I send you greetings from the land of Israel, from the Galilee, where Yeshua our Lord walked along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, one time also on the water, going up on the mountains, teaching, preaching, loving, healing, delivering from demons, raising up from the dead, and above all, bringing the gospel of the good news to the household of Israel, and later on from here, it went out to all the ends of the earth. Today, 2,000 years later, the gospel of the good news is coming back, returning back to Israel. For me personally, it is so exciting to be here, standing in Tiberias um, at the Peniel Fellowship. If you ever want to visit us and you don't know where we're located, you just go to John chapter 6, verses 1 and 3, and you'll find our address there. It says there that Yeshua went up on the mountain uh, near the Sea of Tiberias, and that's exactly where we're located, on the mountain over the Sea of Tiberias. Isn't it something unique? So very special. Uh, to stand as an Israeli, to have here with me my Hebrew Bible in the land of Israel, you know, I'm a son of a Holocaust survivor. My father was one of the few that survived Auschwitz and came here to this land in 1948 and, and fought the independence war. You see, this is a miracle that the state of Israel survived it all. We had no army and we were invaded by five Arab armies. We had hardly any weapons at all, no tanks, no airplanes, and yet we won this war. Amazing. It is really a miracle. We're living in a miracle to see prophecies that were spoken two and a half thousand years ago and are being fulfilled before our eyes. Not just a regathering of the nation of Israel and, and the Jews coming out of the land of the north of Russia and not only surviving all of these wars, but also what is yet to come. It is very intense, very, very exciting to live in these days. We see right now how, again, there is a new enemy to the nation of Israel that wants to come and destroy us. The new Hitler, his name is Ahmadinejad, he's the president of Iran, and he's working on his atom bomb, on his nuclear bomb, wanting to burn us away. But let me tell you, the God of Israel is alive, and he neither slumbers nor sleeps, and he will protect this land and his nation. We praise him. I believe in him. I am a Jew who believes with all of my heart that Yeshua is the Messiah of Israel, an Israeli born here in this land. And what I'm going to share with you are secrets from the Word of God, secrets which God in these end times is revealing through His Holy Spirit. As we're reading the Old New Testament in its original language, with the help and the guidance and the teacher as the Holy Spirit, Things are opening up. These are mysteries that were uh, covered up and hidden away. But now in the end times, God promised and told the prophet Daniel, Go, Daniel, these things are sealed till the end times, when then God is going to open them up. And those, the wise people, Amaskilim in Hebrew, they will understand. And this is coming true. So I'll be sharing with you in these coming sessions some of these wonderful secrets. You see, I've also had the privilege of being and still am an officer in the Israeli army. And every military plan has got three major components to it. Uh, first of all, you have to analyze the territory, the area where the action is going to take place. You study all the mountains and hills and valleys and whatever is on them. Uh, God's plan of salvation for mankind has got a territory. It's the land of Israel that He has chosen to carry out His action. Um, then there are the forces in a military plan. You, you uh, examine the enemy forces, you examine and study your own forces. And so also in God's plan of salvation for mankind, you have this element of our forces and enemy forces. Well, God chose Israel as His forces. And he chose us as a nation not because we were great or good or perfect or anything like that. He chose us just because he did. You know, he chose Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It is his choice. God is God. The same way that he chose every one of you 
Gentiles from the nations who came to believe in Yeshua, the son of David, who came to believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel. Why did he choose you? It's not because you were worthy of it. None of us have been worthy of it. It's just his choice because God is God. And so God chose Israel, and through Israel, everything that mankind has came through this nation. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament. We had the fathers, the prophets, the covenants. Above all, the Messiah, Yeshua, that gave the new covenant through his blood. That all took place in this land, in Jerusalem. You know, from the time of Malkitzedek, who was a high priest after the order. Yeshua is a high priest after the order of Malkitzedek. Uh, and Abraham meeting him, and through the sacrifice of Isaac, which was stopped in the last moment, that on the Mount of Moriah, where later on the first temple was built, and the second temple. That's where Yeshua was born, in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is what? Uh, some five kilometers away from, from, uh, from Mount Moriah. This is where Yeshua was crucified. This is where he rose up from the dead. This is where he went up to heaven from the Mount of Olives. It's all right there. And that's where he's going to come back to. And Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, is going to be the eternal capital. Not just here the, the, on earth, the next thousand years this will be the capital, but the eternal capital forever and ever. So you see, God chose a nation. He chose the land. Then there are also the powers of the enemy. And these are symbolized in the Bible through Amalek, who tried to stop and resist the children of God Israel from moving out of Egypt from slavery and entering into their inheritance, the land of Canaan. So also today, the powers of darkness are trying to hinder the chosen people of God, those from all over the world who came to believe in the true and only one God. The enemy is trying to block. He's trying to hold us up. But, hallelujah, our God is the Almighty One. And the enemy will not succeed, not with what he has done, is doing, or what he will still be doing in the future. And then, dear ones, we have uh, every military plan would have the third component, and that is a time schedule. When are you going to do what? Who is doing it? How they are doing it? And so time plan. And God has revealed in Leviticus chapter 23 his time plan. We have there eight appointed times which God says they are holy. They belong to me. Anything that is holy, dear ones, means that God took it to himself and God has a special purpose for it. So are we holy? That means Yeshua bought our lives with his blood. He paid not with money, not with silver and gold, but he paid with himself to purchase us, to deliver us out of our sins. And we're holy. We belong to him. Our lives should honor him and uh, should uh, be used to honor him, to fulfill the purposes of his kingdom. So we're holy, but also these times, these appointed times which God has chosen, they are holy. They're consecrated to God. So there are eight of these times, and during these next sessions, we're going to unfold what is the meaning of these eight appointed times. And we're going to see that these eight ones begin with the Shabbat. The first one is the Saturday. And that Saturday actually was already given in the beginning, in the creation, the very first week of creation, God gave the Shabbat. He consecrated that. Uh, what does it mean? We will be discussing later on. Then we have the next three uh, appointed times. The first one is called the Passover. And that would be just one day would be the 14th day of the first year, of the first month. Uh, the second of them, which would be the third of these um, uh, holidays, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And this is commemorated for seven days, where God commanded us to eat only unleavened bread. And the next one, number four, is the Feast of Weeks. Only one day. Now, the first one, the Shabbat, repeats itself every week. But the next three ones occur only once a year. They're annual feasts. So here we have three annual feasts, one to three annual feasts, and one weekly feast. 
But their order in Leviticus 23 is just one, two, three, four. Now these holidays or appointed times or celebrations are, um, appear in the first month of the year. It is Nisan, the uh, month of Nisan in the biblical, Hebrew biblical uh, name of it. And this would be March, April in our secular calendar today. Springtime. Uh, Shavuot, the fourth one, is, uh, appears 50 days or seven full weeks. And on the 50th day after the Shabbat, the Sunday of the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. So it's a 50, it's like, you know, planet Earth has got a moon that circles around it. Well, Shavuot, this feast, the Feast of Weeks, is like a moon circles around the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 50 days away from it. Okay, then we have a long break from springtime all the way to autumn. In Israel, this is a dry season. Everything dries away. The, the nice flowers and the green fields of uh, wintertime and springtime, they all turn yellow. They dry away. They become thorns. And that period of time in our history was also in its fulfillment, its prophetic fulfillment, we'll see it later on, was also a time when Israel went out to diaspora, the land of Israel literally became a desert, a dead land, fell into a deep sleep. But anyway, we have then this long break, and then we have autumn feast, feast number five, memorial of blowing of the trumpets, which the rabbis called Rosh Hashanah, or New Year. But this is not a biblical term. This is not the new year. The real new year is right here in springtime. That's when God says this is the first month of the year. God said clearly in Leviticus chapter 23 that this is the seventh month of the biblical calendar. Okay, and so it begins with this feast called Memorial of Blowing of Trumpets, or in Hebrew, Zichron Tru'ah. In Hebrew, it's just two words. In English, it's much more... Uh, usually you take of any verse of the Bible in Hebrew and where you find three words in Hebrew, you would find seven, eight, or nine of them in English. So the Bible, the English Bible, is actually often not just a translation, it's often an explanation, an interpretation of what the biblical text is. And it's so precious to be able to go back into the original Hebrew and just discover the true meaning of what it is uh, without it being processed by some uh, translators. And so the number six is the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur in Hebrew. Again, just one day. And then number seven is the Feast of Tabernacles, which is celebrated for seven days. And the last one, Solemn Assembly, Shmini Atzeret in Hebrew. Again, just one day. Now, if we look at it, we see there is a symmetric structure here. One, one, seven, one. And again, one, one, seven, one. This was in the beginning, right from the week of creation. Ver, uh, feast number two, three, and four have all been fulfilled in the past, and we will see this in the more in, as we go on. And feast number five through eight are all yet prophetic. They have not been fulfilled. Now, what do I mean by it? They have not been fulfilled. You see, each one of these feasts would have three uh, meanings to it. The first meaning is historical meaning. For example, the Passover is to commemorate the time, that same night, when the angel of death went through the land of Egypt, slaying all the firstborn sons, and he passed over the houses of the land of Egypt. And we have here a house, one of these houses of the Israelites, when the angel of God saw the blood on the door Post, the blood of the lamb, that's when he skipped. That's when he did not go through the house and did not kill the firstborns in it. And so that Passover commemorates that event. Also the Feast of Unleavened Bread commemorates the, the time that we had to quickly get out of Egypt and there was no time to make real bread. So we had this flat bread, the, flat, the, the matzah is called in Hebrew, this bread. It's without yeast in it, okay? And then uh, we have the Feast of uh, Tabernacles. And this feast commemorates that God told or allowed the, the children of Israel to dwell in booths 
for 40 years as they were wandering in the wilderness. And so we have here a typical booth covered with these uh, palm branches. Now, not all of these feasts have an historical meaning, but those that I've mentioned do have. Some of these feasts have agricultural meaning. And uh, for example, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, this is when the high priest would uh, take in the temple a handful of wheats that ripened. These are the very, very first fruit of that same year and he would wave it before God. So it is the very first fruit of the year uh, that ripen and, and uh, agriculturally. Then also the Feast of Weeks would be 57 uh, weeks, full weeks later, and that would be the time when really the harvest began. Because by that time all the fields turned from green to yellow and the harvest was ready to be ripened, uh, to be uh, collected, gathered. And so this is the Feast of Weeks. And then the Feast of Tabernacles again has got a agricultural significance in that it is the end of the harvest season. It's the end. So we saw that some of them have historical meaning. We saw some of them have uh, agricultural meaning. But all of them have a prophetic and spiritual meaning. And this is the most exciting part. And this is the part that we're going to focus on. You see, the focus will not be on traditions, on what you just eat or drink or dance or do. The focus would be on the true meaning that God has for these Bibles. This is what is precious to us. This is what we have to take to heart. Let me tell you, so many people relate to the Old Testament as something of the past, not relevant anymore. They just go to their churches with the New Testament. That's a big mistake, dear ones. These feasts, yes, they're only shadows of the real thing, but some of them are still prophetic. And this is why they're so relevant for us. What do they hold in them? What are the secrets? What is the message that God has in store for us for these last days? Well, dear ones, this you'll have to wait and tune in and we will unfold this before you by the grace of God. God bless you.